guys, it's Katie and Elisha from the blog and podcast, Now That We're a Family.com. And well trained children, well behaved children are such a delight to be around. And children are so much more secure when they know what is expected of them in each given situation. And so, some of these tips that we're going to share with our little baby boot camp that we do here, we have gleaned from our parents. We've kind of modified it for our own families. But I'm the oldest of 11. Elisha's one of 10 and we both had great experiences growing up and us and our siblings are all continuing to have children <laughs> that are a delight and a joy to be around. So we wanted to share some of the practical things that we do to tie heartstrings with our children and also train them in the way that they should go. Yeah, Katie referenced Proverbs 22, 6, train up your child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we've taken that word train very literally. So often, I think when we think of parenting and we think of disciplining our children, it's all reactionary. It's correcting them. It's seeing something that they've done improperly and we correct them. And of course, that's a part of parenting. But that verse implies proactive training, thinking ahead, being preemptive, setting the expectation, maybe even practicing. When you think of practicing an instrument for a recital or for a performance, the ratio of practice to the performance is, is, is far heavier, right? You put way more time into the preparation and then you do the real thing. And that's the same in, with a sports team. You spend way more time practicing than you do in the game. And same with military, right? They spend way more time training than they do in the live operation or the, or the live mission. And so when I think of this in parenting, we wanna practice and rehearse and train as much as we can for different environments that, and situations that we might find ourselves in in life. Yeah, so we aren't parenting experts and that's not what we're claiming here. We, our oldest is six years old. So you have a six-year-old, five-year-old, four-year-old, two-year-old, and we're expecting our fifth. But we have learned some things that have really helped us navigate the toddler years. And before we dive into the practical training side of things, sometimes when it comes to behavior, we don't have our children's heart and they just need to know that we care about them and they're shouting for attention by their negative behavior. So slowing down, sometimes just ignoring the behavior completely and choosing to tie heartstrings with that child, to sit with them, to read them a story, to make sure technology isn't anywhere available, we're looking them in the eye, we're connecting with them on that real personal level and make sure that they know that mommy and daddy really care about them, we love them, and we're pouring into them. Sometimes that can eradicate a lot of negative behavior just on its own. But then we like to take it a step further and get very practical because toddlers do see things in a very black and white fashion. They aren't super nuanced in the way that they see the world. And so it's really easy to set these clear guidelines for them and they know that when they bump up, bump up against that guideline they know what to expect or they know the consequence that happens if that expectation isn't met so some of these practical kind of exercises that we're going to give with you we don't start with our kiddos until they're maybe 18 months to two years of age and then we continue doing it and obviously it changes as they change and they grow and mature but this really is the thought behind this is that we get to in a controlled environment practice scenarios and what's great about this is that we can make this fun we can make it kind of like a game you know I, I, hebrews 12 or I think hebrews 11 12 says no chastening for the moment seems joyous but is grievous and when you think about that like oh this is a grievous thing but when you're training you can be proactive and make it a fun joyous thing but of course correction and in, in real time that's a grievous thing what comes from it is good so when we think of training we want to make this 
an enjoyable experience. Yeah, we really want to ensure two things. One, that Elisha and I are on the exact same page with what the expected behavior is because we don't want our kids to play favorites or feel like they can manipulate the situation. So Elisha and I both need to be on the same page as far as like, what we're going to expect from our children. And then also the expectation from our children or for our children is always first time obedience with a happy heart. It's not obeying, dragging your feet, it's obedience with a happy heart. And the younger you start with this, the more it becomes a muscle that they flex. And down the road, they can ask why after they obey happily with a, um, with a happy heart and they had that first time obedience, it just becomes this reflex where just like whining can become a reflex, right? Like where if we say, okay, go do this, and then they just drop on the floor in a puddle, that can become the, exp the response that happens over and over and over and gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So with these playing games and this way to positively be proactive, we're able to build that muscle of happy obedience. Uh, like you said, when it's not in a situation where we're needing that obedience, where it can be kind of stressful more out in public or something like that. So the very first exercise or game that we do with our kiddos, and this starts at a pretty young age, is simply the obedience game. And this is setting up scenarios where they need to obey us immediately. And so Katie and I will take maybe some of their favorite toys and we'll set them across the room and we'll say, okay, Leon, when Leon's two years old or three years old, we'll say, go over to your toys, but don't touch any of them. And he has to walk over to his toys and not touch any of them. And then we say, okay, Leon, pick up one of your toys and go give it to your sister. And he has to pick up the toy and go give it to his sister. And this is something that we're, it's kind of funny. He's, he's like laughing, he's like, what are we doing here? And if he's disobedient, because we're playing a game, we're not gonna give a harsh you know, consequence to it. We'll do something fun. We'll be like, okay, we've got to do push-ups now. You didn't do it. So we'll get on the ground and I'll do five push-ups with him. Or I'll be like, okay, you didn't do it. You've got to lay, lay on your belly, okay? And tap your toes to the ground and do something kind of funny as the consequence. Because again, this isn't real life. So that's the first game we play with our kids. And it's one of the exercises that we do. It's simply the obedience game. And we'll set up different scenarios where we say, okay, see the tree over there? run all the way to the tree and we and they run all the way to the tree but then we tell them stop and they have to stop right away okay so it's kind of we're throwing them off they're like wait you told me to go here but then they need to know and we say stop they've got to stop and so we'll set up scenarios like that to really train them to obey us on on the spot because of course you need to have that in real life situations when you say stop they need to stop and when you say run they need to run when they say when you say come they need to come yeah, and this is, when we started with our first, it was just me and the toddler, or just Elisha and the toddler. We started this, I think when Leon was about, as soon as he could walk, maybe like 14 months, because we took him out to eat at a restaurant. It was outside on a curb, and we told him to stop, and he just ran out into the street. And that's where both of us were like, okay, that was the most stressful dinner experience ever. We really need to drill this. He needs to know we're serious. And so it's one thing when you're working with one child, it becomes really fun when you have positive peer pressure. So if you have multiple kids, you can have the big kids do this first to kind of show the little kids how to do it. And they get a kick out of it because you know, it's not hard for them to figure out what to do. And then the toddler thinks it's really cool to kind of copycat the older brothers and sisters. So even though this is a really basic game, you still play it with our six-year-old and five-year-old. Oh, yeah. And then anything that you want to drill that is becoming like a stressful situation. So if you're getting your two-year-old in their car seat and they're arching their back and fighting you on that, well, that's becoming a response that they're going to consistently do. And it's stressful when you're in public or you need a load up and that's happening. And so bringing the car seat into the car and being like, okay, we're going to practice getting in your car seat. Yeah, or even bring it into the house. Bring it into yeah. your house. Yeah, usually it's in the car. Bring it, even bring it into your house. You could do that too. Thank you. Um, and maybe practicing with a bigger kid that's not in a car seat and that makes it all funny at first. And then you have the toddler get in and everyone gets to cheer when the toddler does it the right way. And then you go take it out to the car and then you practice getting into the car and it can kind of erase the negative pattern that has been happening with these positive reinforcements. Something else that we train our children to do is engage socially. You know, we don't inherently 
come into this world with good social skills. It's something that we either learn or it's, well, we're gonna learn it. And it's either gonna be proactively taught to us by our parents or we're gonna learn it from our peers, from the people around us. And we'd rather not our kids learn their social cues from other five and six year olds that they're around in the, in the local neighborhood. And so we'll play games with them where, for instance, I'll line all the kids up in the living room and I'll look at Lucy and I go, hi there, what's your name? And she has to step forward. She goes, my name's Lucy. But then this is the thing. She has to think of a question to ask back. Okay, so they can't just give one word answers or they can't just answer the question. They need to think of something to ask back. And so she would say, hey, my name's Lucy. And then of course she would ask, what's your name? I go, oh, my name's Elisha. How old are you, Lucy? She can say, oh, I'm five. And then she has to think of a question to ask. Where do you live? What do you do for work? And so the, we're teaching our kids how to carry on a conversation because this isn't, this isn't natural for most kids. It's, it's a skill that is either learned or you over time through pain have to figure out how to carry on a conversation. And so that's a really fun game that the kids, of course, I ask different questions or the, the standards are different depending on their age and capabilities, but it's a game that all the kids now are two-year-old up to our six-year-old like to play. And like Katie said, we start this with the older kids and our two-year-old wants to be a part of it, you know? And so he has to sit there quietly and I look at him and I ask him his name and he mumbles something and he feels really good about himself yeah. too. And, and, and again, some of the rules are they need to look you in the eye. Yeah. And so the boys have to stand, they have to shake your hand, look you in the eye. And it's crazy how our propensity is to not do that. And the boys go out and they try so hard when they're meeting somebody new to look them in the eye and they just, everything in them wants to look to the ground or look past them. And so it's really fun to practice that at home and then see them try to exercise it out in public and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Be like, hey, remember when you shook Mr. You know, Johnson's hands? Did you look in his eye? Like, no, that was so hard. And we're like, yeah, that's why we practice it because it's not natural feeling, but it's a good social skill to have. Yeah, so that's a fun thing that Elisha trains with our older children. Something else that you can do with even down to a two or three year old is training for interruptions. And so if mommy's having a conversation, you know, Elisha and I will role play this where we explain the expectation to the kiddos and then we practice it. Okay, so daddy and I are having a conversation. We talk, they need to come up and put their hand on our arm and say, excuse me. And they just say it one time and then they just wait. And then we keep having a conversation and then turn to them and be like, hey, what do you need, you know? And again, starting off with, we respond pretty quickly at first. And then once they know that we will respond, they can trust us to respond, we can kind of stretch out our conversation a little bit and then respond to them and make them wait there a little bit longer before they get that um, need for daddy and mommy. Because that could be a thing when you have a lot of kiddos and you're trying to have a conversation, you're trying to wrap up and they're just like, mommy, 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 or daddy, 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 and they're just clamoring on you. Um, it's the same thing with the phone as well. If I'm on the phone, then you come up, you say, excuse me, and you wait there until there's a pause for me to be able to um, come to you. So that is something that will also role play is for interruptions. Yeah, we like reading the Little House in the Prairie books and Almanzo Wilder, you know, in the farmer boy book, I think that's the one where he explains this. Um, he talks about how, you know, children are to be seen, not heard. That was the rule in their household. And it was a strict rule. And there are only rare exceptions where he was, you know, able to participate in the conversation. And we like our kids being able to talk with us at the dinner table. And we pretty much only have little kids. And so it'd be, you know, a pretty quiet table if they weren't able to say anything. Well, we talk a lot. Yeah, we do talk a lot. <laughs> but when it is important for the kiddos to just be spectators and not participators in the conversation, it's fun to have that reference. We'll say, Remember Almanzo? We'll say, remember the Almanzo rule? And they know exactly what we're talking about. And that's, they get to sit there quietly while we finish our big kid conversation. And this will go out into other social interactions. And this can happen in very real time. Just yesterday, my brother Tucker called me and he was driving through town and he asked if I wanted to get coffee. And, and so I said, sure. Do you guys want the whole story? Wow. Wow. <laughs> I said, which coffee shop do you want to meet at? Okay, what are you going to be drinking? No. <laughs> uh, and the three kids were up from their nap, Leon, Lucy, and Louie, and Katie and Lawrence were still napping. And so I thought, I'll take these kids, I'll take the three kids, and I'll go meet with my brother Tucker. And I told them, I go, hey, we're going to go, and I'm going to get you guys something, but you're not going to ask for anything at the coffee shop. I'll order it for you. I guess I want you to put your hands in your pockets. Show me how you put your hands in your pockets. Don't touch anything in the display case. 
And then when Tucker and I are talking, you guys can sit and listen quietly. And if you have a question about our conversation or something to contribute, you can. But if you're bored with our conversation, you guys can have your own conversation, but you're not gonna inter interrupt us. That might seem kind of stiff and rigid, but maybe you've experienced this where you take your kids and you're trying to have a grown up conversation and your kids wanted to come, they wanted to be a part of it and two minutes into it, they're like, I'm bored. What are we doing here? Like, I want to get things going. So I wanted to set the expectation with in our... the car before you guys went in. Yes. And I, and I go, you know what I mean? By putting your hands in your pocket. Yeah. And this is the same thing we practice when we go into the grocery store. Because when you've got four walkers, four toddlers or, you know, young children to toddlers, they want to touch everything in the grocery store. So you're going through the produce and they're saying, hey, can we get this? Or look at, look at how huge this pumpkin is. Or look at this. Can look I at these this? grapes. Can I have this? Yeah. Exactly. And there needs to be a standard for no hands on your side or hands in your pocket and you guys don't touch anything you can look but you can't go around the grocery store you can't go to, up to the display case in the coffee shop and pull everything out asking for it and so that's something that we've needed to practice and again this is count contrary to little kids instincts right when they go into the grocery store into a co they want to go show you everything and again we're not going to derail them asking questions like if they are curious about you know the difference between the organic and the conventional strawberries and they want to ask that question they can ask but they don't need to go get both packages and show you and i use the example of grown-ups i go do you see all the grown-ups picking up everything in the display case and looking at it no they stand and they look at it and they choose which one they want and they pick it up and they go buy it. So anyways, those are just a few examples of things that I drill on a regular basis with our kiddos because they're reoccurring situations. It's reoccurring that I bring our that I bring my children into a grocery store or that I bring them into a coffee shop or that I'm with them while I'm having a conversation with another grown-up. It's reoccurring that we're close to a busy street and they need to stop on the dime when we say stop. And it's reoccurring when we're eating out at a restaurant and we, they don't get to just to ask the server or the waiter over and over and over again for things. We have to practice yeah. those things. Yeah, and all these things, it makes for a very delightful time because you're able to enjoy the kids. They feel your enjoyment of them being there. You take them to more things because, I mean, they go with daddy all the time to things because Elisha can trust that they're going to behave in that environment. and it way beats the times when we've gone out and we haven't set the expectation for the environment in the car and then we get in there, no one knows what to expect. We're stressed at them and they know that we're displeased and it's just a hectic conversation. Like you're just reacting in the moment. And so this makes going to restaurants a pleasant experience and it, and it makes everything. It makes it fun oh. for the kids and it makes it fun for you. Another thing that you mentioned grocery stores and just that whole concept of like kids learn by touching and feeling and nature and all those things, obviously. So going out like having like when we're outside, they can pick up whatever they want and bring it to us, you know, but there are certain environments where we have to have more self-control and something that my mom used to do because there were, you know, seven or eight or nine of us that would go to the grocery store with her at one time were as she was going through the store with her grocery cart we were all clogging up the aisles like there were just kids everywhere and someone would come from the other direction and we didn't really know where to go and they didn't know where to go and it was just stressful for everybody and so something that we would drill in our home when i was younger was my mom would say she'd pretend to be going you know around the living room with the grocery cart and we'd all be all over the place and then she'd just say to the side and we'd all jump to the side of the aisle wherever she was so if that was right or left or whatever we just get to the side and that just made shopping so much easier that one little drill all of a sudden we knew what to expect she knew what to say and it was just like this clear parting of the waters yeah so and that same drill applies to a bunch of different environments because we use, we use the same thing when we're biking along the path mm -hmm. that that naturally happens kids don't understand the right the the rules of the road instinctually we're like oh i need to get to the right or i need to let this person pass and so we had to drill when there's an oncoming bike or when there's somebody coming up behind us we just say get to the side our kids know what's happening while they're doing it and they obey it right away because we practiced it because we explained it to them gave them that expectation and the side that they get to i would just specify is whatever side daddy and mom are on instead of them having to remember do i go right do i go left because sometimes to the side can just make everything more confusing so anyways those are some things that we drill there's probably like 15 or 20 things that we go through but honestly taking things completely out of the environment first doing it in your living room and then going into that environment with the sole purpose of 
we're practicing in mind instead of having a clear objective can be really helpful. Just going to the grocery store with the clear objective of, hey, I'm gonna buy a couple things, but this isn't my big week long grocery trip. I'm just basically doing a run through while I'm calm and patient and don't have this big agenda of let's just practice here in the grocery store or let's go to the coffee shop as a family where we aren't meeting friends and we aren't trying to hold a conversation. And the only thing is to help the kiddos establish expectations when we're in this environment. That can be a second step or a second tier to then going full blown into an environment and hoping that everything just goes well. Yep. And you're going to find that there are new environments that you find yourself in as a family where you're like, wow, we haven't had an opportunity to drill this because we haven't been in this situation before. That's happened just a couple days ago with me and the boys. We were out on a property and I was meeting with a developer there and we were walking the, this property. And anytime my boys have been outside with me in this environment, it was just like adventure time. So they would ask me questions. They would show me snakes and lizards and the big stick that they found. That was their context for being out in nature. This was a little different this time, but I didn't set that expectation for my boys going out, being like, hey, daddy needs to meet with this guy. There's a, a bunch of important stuff that we need to go over. And so as a, as a result, the, the experience wasn't as positive for the boys or for me, but we were able to talk about it afterwards because they were like, man, you were no fun. You didn't want to look at any of the bird's nests that we found, you know, or talk about them like you usually do. And I had to be like, hey, you know what? You can't interrupt daddy when I'm talking to somebody. We had to reestablish the expectations for a situation like that. So it's not to say that you will always know what the environment is going to throw at you, which is why training obedience is crucial because above all these things, there's unexpected things that come up in life. You know, there's a stranger that's walking past the normal place that you guys usually play and the kids are fully comfortable running to play at that place, but you call them back and they just need a, They don't need an explanation for it there in the moment. They need that first time obedience. And then later you can explain it to them when they ask and they're inquiring as to why. Yeah, so we're gonna have a blog post up on nowthatwe'rafamily.com kind of explaining just some of the things we talked about in this video and a few of the other things that we like to go over and just train from the baby boot camp to now we're getting into a little more older ages where there's more social skills and more nuance involved now. Um, so you guys can reference that if you found this helpful and we will have that linked down below if you enjoyed this video. What do you do? Give it one, give it one thumbs up. And subscribe. Okay, and we will see you next Bye. Thursday. Bye. <laughs>Hey you guys, I just wanted to tell you real quick about my homeschooling course, Homeschooling the First Three Years. It's all about laying a foundation of joy and confidence and fun and simplified homeschool in your home. So if you're in a place where maybe you're considering homeschooling your kiddos in the next few years, then this course is for you. It's gonna break down not only what we do for homeschool and our family and what we've done for the first three years in homeschool, but it's also going to show you exactly how that looks. So I'm going to take a camera around with me vlog style and show you how does it look to homeschool with a baby? How does it look to homeschool with a toddler? How does it look to homeschool multiple grades at one time? How do you navigate um, different learning tendencies? How do you navigate your learning style as a teacher? And how do you motivate children and get them to love learning? I love homeschooling my kids. One of my favorite things that I get to do with them each day. And it's something that I want you to love doing with your children as well well. So if you look down in the description box, you will be able to find a discount code where you can get a discount off of homeschool the first three years. And I really hope that it blesses your home.